Hello there. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you? My man, what's up, Jordan? Hello. Hi, how's everybody doing? Mike. What's up, Mike? Shout out to Mike. Where's everybody checking in from? Is it cold out there? That's not too bad. It's a little chilly. The past couple days have been pretty nice around here. It was super cold, then it got nice. Now it's starting to die off a little bit. You was just watching a video of mine. Cool. Well, thanks for dropping in on the live. We got Brooklyn, Arkansas, St. Cloud, Florida, Decatur, Alabama, Denmark. Where else we at? California, Texas. Oh, wait, you're in college down in Texas. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Dallas, Newark, Illinois, St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. Oh my gosh, I vacationed there last winter. Well, it wasn't a vacation. It was my wife's 40th birthday. St. Thomas is beautiful. Oh my goodness. If you've never been to the Virgin Islands, go. Go to the Virgin Islands. That is so cool. I got somebody tuning in from St. Thomas. It's such a small, little, amazing place. And to see, see somebody on here on my live is really neat to me. San Antonio. Hello. Miami. Really cool. Let's go ahead and get started so how's everybody doing today everybody doing well i hope you are all doing well um if you're new to my ministry uh, my name is matt mcmillan i'm a christian author i've written seven books all my books are available on amazon in paperback and kindle looks like there was a comment here that just popped up i wanted to answer do you take request calls no I don't take phone calls but you can always email me if you want to interact with me I'll always interact via email my email address is matt at matt mcmillan.com that's m-a-t-t at m-a-t-t m-c-m-i-l-l-e-n matt mcmillan with an e-n dot com shoot me an email I'll be glad to interact with you as far as like me interacting in my dms on social media I don't always interact with those. They come flooding in and I honestly, I, I don't have time to respond to all of the direct messages. So if you want to contact me, I always sit down once a day and I go through all of my emails for my ministry. So if you want to contact me, shoot me an email. It's matt at mattmcmillan.com. All right. So um, what else? What else can I tell you about myself that a lot of people wonder? Um, I'm not a pastor. I always like to say that. I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. Um, not that pastors aren't regular people. Sometimes people take that wrong when I say it. Sometimes people assume that I'm insulting pastors or downgrading pastors. I love pastors. Nothing wrong with being a pastor. The problem is when we have that position, air quotes, of pastor, above Christ. Some people become pastors just so they can manipulate. Not everybody, not every, not every pastor. Keep this in mind. This is not, <laughs> this is not black or white here. Each individual person is an individual person, but some pastors actually become pastors. Some people actually take on that position of pastors so that they can control people so that people can, Oh, Always look to them for every answer because that's where their tendency of the flesh goes to. Now, when I say the flesh, I'm not talking about their physical body. I'm talking about a separate entity altogether. Um, some people are tempted in different ways. The flesh presents itself in different ways. Some people have um, an addiction to alcohol 
and the flesh stirs that up in their minds? Me? That's a tendency that the flesh leads me toward. Some people have a tendency of the flesh in sexual ways. Some people have a tendency of the flesh in self-righteousness, self-righteousness ways. So when I say I'm not a pastor and I say, love your pastor, respect your pastor, but view your pastor for who they are. They're a regular person just like me and you. So the pastor position, again, it's not a position. It is a spiritual gift. And that spiritual gift is listed one time in the New Testament. It's in Ephesians. It's not even in what we have named the pastoral letters. First Timothy, second Timothy, Titus, those aren't pastoral letters. We've called them pastoral letters. <laughs> Were they pastors? Maybe. Did they oversee a group of people? Probably. But we have retrofitted pastor onto everything. Pastor, 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 pastor. Uh, what we have set up. We even see this in some of the new covenant camp. There are some people who are in the new covenant and they still struggle with looking to this great and all powerful individual who knows everything about everything and is never wrong. Let's go check in with them. I'm not about that. And I've been involved with that. And I said, I'm not interested. I'm going to go over here and I'm just going to be free with all these regular people. We don't have to check into any particular individual for all the answers. Some people have their ministry set up on, I have every answer. And you've never heard them one time say, you know what? You might be right. I'll think about that. It's no, you're wrong. I'm right. Get in line. And then they have gatekeepers and they have bodyguards where if you question that pastor, new covenant or not new covenant, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be ostracized. Oh, this person that because they said this to pastor so-and-so. So this is how they are. <laughs> Happens in the new covenant. I've experienced it. Happens in churches who teach law and grace. I've experienced it. So where is all of these factions coming from? The pastor position. Position. So let's refocus. The new covenant does not tell us to follow any particular person. The new covenant does not elevate the spiritual gift of shepherding to any particular position. This is why when people say women can't preach, they are looking at what we have turned the pastor position into and then retrofit that onto women. See it? So it's a big cluster, you know what, a big jumble of crap and it's error. So we have to repent from seeing a pastor as Christ himself nearly to we're a body, we're all regular people. We're all interacting. We're all figuring this life out in Christ. We don't see anything in scripture that leads us to believe what our modern church has turned our Sunday event into. It's not there. So what do we see in scripture? When the church began, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the body of Christ. Delete the word church as in a building or a gathering with a group. So when the church began, it's just a bunch of people just figuring this thing out, making mistakes, getting together, having meals together, having arguments, figuring out this life in Christ. They didn't have the word to stand on. They didn't have, you know, um, I got to check in with so-and-so. No, it was Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the once for all forgiveness. Let's talk about this amazing new covenant that was brought in at the cross. And then let's love each other, love one another, love one another, love one another. Get rid of the factions, get rid of the hierarchies. So I'm not a pastor. When I say I'm not a pastor, I, I say that to help dilute some of the error in your mind of this hierarchy of power that our modern church has come up with. Our modern church has come up with this hierarchy of power. I want you to be confident. I want you to be confident in Christ and I want you to be confident in who you are as a child of God. That's what my ministry is all about, confidence. I want to help you build up your confidence in who Jesus is. I want to help you build up your confidence in who you are. All right. Now, do you want to touch quickly on this confidence thing I talk about? When I say build up confidence, when you see somebody who's super confident, are they thinking about themselves being confident? No, they're just 
being themselves. They're not thinking, oh, I gotta be confident, gotta be confident. But they get to that point because they have confident thoughts. They are affirmed with confident words. They understand who they are and they be. So when I say these things to you and I enforce just how powerful the blood of Jesus is through my words to your ears, and when I enforce these new covenant truths of what Christ brought in at the, the cross, my mouth to your to your ears, I'm building up your confidence. I'm trying to edify you. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm never going to focus on your behavior because any unbeliever can change the behavior. There are many unbelievers who change their behavior thinking that because they've changed their behavior, they're saved. Nope. We have to get new life. That new life comes from Christ. Once we receive Christ, we get a new identity. We get a new spirit. He becomes one with us. Then we begin to have organic actions and attitudes that match up with who we are. We're not having proper behavior to be. We're having proper behavior because we are. And we're not having proper behavior to sustain. We're having proper behavior because we know that's never going to change. I am perfect. You are perfect. That's hard to hear. Because we co-mingle what we do with who we are. So when I say I'm perfect, when I say you're perfect as a child of God, I am not talking about what you do. <laughs> you have to, I'm not talking about what I do. You have to separate your who from your do. Hebrews 10, 14 says you have been perfected. You are perfect. This is scripture. This is not me coming up with this. Hebrews 10 says you're perfect. You are perfect. But this does not compute. This does not compute. This does not compute. It goes around in our head because we're thinking of the stuff that we do rather than the stuff that Christ has done. So the only way you could possibly become perfect is if you access the blood of Jesus by grace through faith. By one offering, you have been made perfect forever. Some translations say those who are being perfected. The original translation does not say those who are being perfected, those who are being sanctified. It, it, it's not there in a present tense form. It's just saying it happened. But even if we look at the translations, which are saying those who are being perfected, those who are being sanctified, that's talking about the believers of the Jews in the future. So every believer who is a Jew in the book of Hebrews, who this was written to, who is believing in this once for all sacrifice of Jesus, they would then become perfected. They would then become sanctified because the only thing that can make you sanctified, which is perfect, which is holy, is what? Blood, the blood of Jesus. That's it, nothing else. So once we get our identity right, our actions and attitudes then begin to match up with our identity. But we got to get our identity first. That's why my book series is The Christian Identity. Because I want you to know who you are as a Christian. All right. Now, so what's the foundation of this identity? The new covenant. What is the new covenant? That is the topic of today's Walk Talk. What is the new covenant? So, uh... I have a confession to make to you guys. The other day, got home from work, got out of my car, walked to my mailbox, opened up the mailbox, got my mail out, and here I am walking back up to the house, cycling, cycling through my mail. Then I see this bill that says, urgent warning, past due. Urgent warning, past due. Basically, they're saying this is about to be a collection letter because you owe a debt. So I'm like, well, what's this? I, you know, I pay my bills and I don't know, know what it would be as far as any outstanding debt. And I'm like, what is this? So my heart starts racing a little bit. I get inside. I sit down on the couch. I slowly open up this bill. I get it out and it's for $9,386. $9,386. And I'm like, what in the world? $9,386 I owe? <sighs> and I'm sitting here holding it. And then I glance back up at the top. 
and it's addressed to my neighbor. <laughs> it's addressed to my next door neighbor. This was not my mail. This is not my debt. This is not my bill. It's my neighbors. The debt does not belong to me. <laughs> now, of course, I'm lying. <laughs> I made that story up. But I say that to let you know how you have no debt because of Christ. The old covenant, everything that was required, everything written to, to the Jews, to Israel, through the law of Moses, 613 commandments, keep these commandments perfectly or else blood must be shed at the annual day of atonement or else I will not bless you or else I will cause a famine or else I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out rain for your crops or else. all of this debt that was in the old covenant. It's not ours. It does not belong to you. It's not my debt. It's not your debt. So you can hold the bill. You can hold the bill in your hand if you want to. You can look at everything. The Ten Commandments. Yep, the Ten Commandments. That's included in the book of the law. And if you want to pull out the Ten Commandments, that would be the same as you pulling out $200 of that $9,000 debt and saying, I'm going to take that $200 out. I owe that $200. I don't owe the $9,000. I just owe the $2,000. That's what we do when we take out the Ten Commandments. You don't even owe the Ten Commandments. Ah, God, this is hard. This is hard. I know, I know, it's hard. But it's not your debt. Jesus paid off that debt 100% at the cross. You are debt free. You owe God nothing. You owe God nothing. I owe, how could you say that, McMillan? I owe him everything after everything he's done for me. How dare you say that? How are you going to pay him back? What are you going to do? I'm asking. What would you do to pay him back? I'm going to give him my life. You didn't have life. You were spiritually dead. I gave my life to Christ. I'm sorry, but you didn't. Christ gave you his life. You received the life of Christ. Christ who is your life. Colossians 3. You were spiritually dead. You had no life to give. Oh, I, just gave, I gave him my whole heart. I just didn't give him pieces of my heart. I gave him my whole heart. You had a wicked, sinful, deceitful heart. He didn't want it. You were born with a sinful heart by no fault of your own because of Adam, what Adam did, no longer believing God. You had no heart to give to God. Your heart was wicked. You received a new heart when you believed. So you're not giving them your all. You're not giving them your life. First of all, you're not giving them your all because he doesn't need anything that you give him. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. You're not giving him your life because you were dead. You were born supernaturally dead on your way to eternal separation from God. You're not giving him your heart either. Who are you talking to, man? <laughs> What's up, John? Uh, I'm doing an Instagram live. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's my buddy I play basketball with. Um, what was I saying? You're not giving him your heart your heart was wicked your heart was sinful your heart was rotten but you received a new heart the instant you believed in Christ for salvation well, the prophet the prophet Ezekiel prophesied about this in the old covenant hundreds of years before the Christ before the cross happened and Christ came he said I will remove your heart of stone and give you a new heart that's happened so your heart's not wicked any longer so when people say the heart is deceitfully wicked, you cannot follow your heart. Calm down, man. Calm down. Y you're right. But that's for unbelievers. Not me. I received a new heart. So there's nothing you could possibly pay God back with. I'm going to put him number one. I'm going to put him first. How? How? You're going to start a church? Going to grow your social media account? What are you going to do? Going to get up and read your Bible every day? Ouch, 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 ouch. I'm talking to myself here. These are the thoughts I used to have. 
if I'm really going to put God first, I, I have this gift of communication. I need to start a church. Then I'll really put God first. I got to get up before everybody in my house and I got to read my Bible every day. Then I'll put God first. I'm going to stop watching that porn. When I stop watching that porn, then I put God first. Dead works. Dead works. Dead works. This is all dead works. This is all dead works. And this is what the Jews were doing in the old covenant. They thought they were doing something to put God first. And Jesus said, you're a brood of vipers. You're whitewashed tombs. Your father is the devil. <laughs> I think it was actually John the Baptist who said brood of vipers. Either way, these people who thought they were actually putting God first. Nope. They were not putting God first, but that's the old covenant. The old covenant is a promise between God and Israel. The old covenant. If you're Jewish, it's not available any longer. The old covenant. And that's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. You know, I hear people say, um, yeah, God will still save the Jews. There's no longer Jew nor Greek. They've been cut out of the tree of life. They have to be grafted back in with us dirty, rotten Gentiles. Formerly dirty, rotten Gentiles. They got to be put back in. They don't get to be saved just because of their lineage. That's what the Jews were thinking. So they had that covenant, the old covenant between God and Israel. It's been replaced. Jesus foretold about this. Let me back up just for a second to talk about the old covenant for momentarily. I don't want to go down that road today because I want to stick to the new covenant. But the old covenant, <laughs> when Moses led his people out of slavery in Egypt, the new covenant was established. The new covenant was established at Mount Sinai. So Moses presented this covenant to the people from God. The people said, we will do everything written in the book of the law, the old covenant. And God said, okay, if you do that, I will bless you. Then Moses sprinkled blood on it. Blood brings in the covenant. It's in place. Now, this covenant was flawed from the beginning. Not the actual covenant, but the ability of the people to keep up their end of the bargain. They could not do it. So a better way was always necessary from the beginning of the old covenant. It was Jesus. They were looking forward to the Messiah, but they didn't know that. They just knew that something better was coming and it's Jesus, the Messiah, the new covenant. That's why Jesus said at the last supper, this is the blood of the covenant in my name. Does that make sense? So then when he went to the cross, the old covenant requirements was nailed to him. The sin of the world nailed to him. He absorbed every sin of every human being who would ever live for all time in himself. He absorbed it. The perfect spotless lamb, the Messiah suffered. You know, those who are in Islam, I've been receiving quite a bit of feedback from Muslims lately. And I'm friendly with them, but they, they want to convince me so badly that Jesus was not the Messiah. They want to say he was a prophet. They want to say God would never do anything so carnal as to kill a person. That's a pagan issue. And they belittle who the Messiah is. And that's everything. This is the son of God. We have to believe. Once we believe, we have accessed the new covenant. So what is the new covenant? The new covenant is the covenant between the father and the son. You're down here. You're not in this covenant. So it used to be God and Israel. God and Israel. Okay. Now it's the father and the son. Israel was removed and then replaced with Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because Hebrews chapter six tells us, by two unchangeable things, God and God, we have this hope for the anchor of our soul. That hope is, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will forgive every one of your sins. I will choose to remember your sins no more. Believe. 
when we believe these, when we believe him, it is God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But the new covenant is between the Father and the Son at the cross, and it came in through his blood. When we believe, we access. We don't reach up and grab it and take it. We don't name it, claim it. We don't need to do that. We receive, hands open, and we receive it once by grace through faith. That's the new covenant. The new covenant is founded on better promises. <laughs> and that's the promise between the Father and the Son. The old covenant, the, the promise was not great coming from Israel. They were terrible promise keepers. That's why the promise keepers conventions, they got it. They, <laughs> I'm going to not go down that road, but the promise keeper conventions. <laughs> oh, I want to say stuff. I'm not going to though, but just know this. The new covenant is nothing about your promise. You don't promise God anything. Your promises are terrible. The new covenant is about God's promise. <laughs> It's about the promise between the Father and the Son. You access their promise. You get to rest. You get to be. That's the new covenant. That's the new covenant. Let's talk about, let's talk about a handful of the, the covenant differences in the, in the four gospels that Jesus talked about, which, which are confusing to some when we don't understand that the new covenant was set aside so that, the, new, that, so that the, the old covenant was set aside so that the new could come into place. We look at some of the stuff in the gospels and are like, this is weird. But when we understand that the old covenant is set aside, it's still there. If you want to go look at it, if you want to go down to a payphone and pick up the payphone, put it on your ear, mess with it, it's obsolete. Hebrews chapter 8 says it's obsolete. It's weak and useless. We have a better covenant with a better guarantor, Jesus. Hebrews tells us that. I will remember your sins no more. That's the new covenant, as opposed to in the old covenant, God's remembering every single sin, and you had to shed your animal's blood at the day of atonement. So Jesus said, this is the blood of the covenant in my name, in my name. Same as in, in Acts 2.38, when um, you know Peter stood up and said, repent and be baptized, in my name. That's the whole point of that. He's not saying you gotta be dipped in water. He's saying, my fellow Israelites, I think it's uh, Acts 2.14, start up there and then read down. Some people want to turn Acts 2.38 into doctrine that you got to be dunked in water and change your behavior. Stop, stop. Water does not save you. He's saying to the Jews, you have to repent of your belief in these Jewish patriarchs to the name of Jesus. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. So repent of your belief from Moses and the patriarchs toward Jesus and then why did the Jews get dunked in water? It was for a clear conscience. John the Baptist was doing this, but that was a clear conscience towards the law. So, I don't know how I got down that rabbit hole. Where was I? Um, Jesus, the new covenant. In the four gospels, let's look at a handful of those things, um, which are, once you understand the new covenant, you're like, whoa! I remember when I first started to get get the foundation of the new covenant that none of the commandments from Moses were directed at me. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. His commandments are not the 613. His commandments are not the 10 commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are listed in the book of 1 John. Believe and love. Okay. So when we, let's look at Martha and Mary, for example, Martha and Mary Jesus is giving a depiction of the old and new covenant. Martha, Martha, you worry about so many things. What was Martha doing? Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Working. Working. Preparing for the Messiah. What was Mary doing? <laughs> Resting at the Messiah's feet. He's here. He's with me. Martha, Martha, you worry about so much. Mary has chosen properly. What was Mary doing? 
was she working? Nope. She was resting. Resting. And we see this reflected in Hebrews chapter 4 when the author is saying, work hard to rest. Strive to enter rest. That was a huge turning point for me. I'm like, what? Strive to rest. Work hard at resting. What? What you mean? Martha was choosing properly. I was the Mary, or I was the Martha. I was the Martha. Mary had choos- chosen properly. I was the one doing a bunch of stuff, trying to appease legalistic relatives, trying to make sure the people at church really saw everything I was doing on Facebook so they could really say good stuff about me. I was working. I was working. I was working. Now I rest. I don't care what they think. <laughs> think what you want. I love y'all. <laughs> Let's hang out. But as far as your opinion about me, it doesn't, it doesn't impact my life because I'm no longer the Martha. Martha, working. Old covenant, Mary, resting. Jesus, Jesus is here. New covenant, what else? Okay, here's another one. Parable of the talents. Law. Parable of the vineyard workers. Grace. Parable of the talents. Old covenant. Parable of the vineyard workers. New covenant. So, the parable of the talents, when we look at this, and for so long, I even said, well, I have to use my talents for God, and I got to make an investment, and I just got to make sure I get a, get a return for for what I do for God. Because when God comes back, I'm going to say, hey, God, look at this stuff. Look at everything I did for the gospel. Look at everything I did for you. I even know some new covenant teachers who teach it like that. <laughs> They're saying this is what you do to produce more for God when he comes back for the gospel. <laughs> no. This is your payment from God if you want to somehow work. You're going to get paid according to what you have done. Christians don't get paid according to what we have done. We get paid according to what Christ has done. What we've done is like filthy rags. This is God. This is God. He, did, he made all this stuff. He made you. We live and breathe through him. But we want to look at the parable of the talents and say, this guy had more talent than that guy and he used it. And that guy didn't have any talent, but he used it. That guy had, he was given some talent, but he just didn't do anything with his talents. Nope. This has nothing to do with your gifts. This has nothing to do with you working to get a return on your investment. This is God paying you back according to the old covenant. This is a covenant different story. What did he say to the guy who didn't do anything? He was separated from him. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's that make the other people think? Ooh, look at me. I did more. Oh, but you did a little bit more. What'd you do, though? Oh, you, oh, you did that? Do you see it? Comparison game. Comparison game. Comparison game. That's not the new covenant. The new covenant is not about that. The new covenant is about, look at Jesus. Look what Jesus did. period. So that's old covenant. New covenant would be the parable of the vineyard workers. All these people lined up to work. The vineyard owner put them to work and all throughout the day. And he agreed. Everybody agreed with him that I'm going to pay you this much for your work. I'm going to pay you this much before they even began doing anything. The vineyard worker said, okay, do that. I'll pay you this much. Some people started out early in the day. Some people started came around lunchtime. Then some people started out at the end of the day. And when they all lined up to be paid at the end, they all got paid the same. Who was salty? Who was jealous? 
who was upset because the vineyard oper, vineyard owner was extremely generous. And what did they look to? To prove that the vineyard owner, you owe me more. You can't pay them the same thing as me. That's too graceful. You owe me more, vineyard owner. Unbelievers, works-based, righteousness, people. And they even agreed. They all got paid the same. Why? Because God is good. Because God is graceful. Because God, when everybody gets to heaven, he's not going to line everybody up and then pay them according to what they have done. We get the same reward in heaven. <laughs> this does not compute. This does not compute. That, those were my thoughts when I first started hearing this. No, that's not true because I do more stuff than everybody else. Everybody else needs to be like me. Everybody else needs to put God first. Everybody else needs to insert insert or then i start belittling the stuff that other people are doing well that's not that great or that's wrong do you see it old covenant new covenant old covenant is the parable of the talents new covenant is the parable of the vineyard workers all right let's do let's do one more and then button this up i know there's one i could think of the, 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 the. jesus taught a lot of parables and once you understand the foundation of the new covenant and you reread these parables you're like whoa oh, that's pretty cool okay here's one the prodigal son the prodigal son how many times growing up did i hear about these prodigals oh he's just a prodigal oh she's she's prodigal daughter it's a prodigal she's just doing bad stuff right now oh he's really far away from the lord He's just a prodigal. What happens at the end of the story? Who ultimately is the real prodigal? I've been with you this whole time and now you're gonna throw a party for this brother of mine? You're gonna kill the fatted calf. You're gonna invite everybody in. You're gonna put your best robe on him. You're gonna put your ring on his finger. That's not fair. I'm not going to celebrate with him. I am not coming into your party. Who was left out? <sighs> Who was the real prodigal? It's not the one who everybody said was out sleeping around, spending all his money and getting drunk. It's the well-behaved one. Jesus' story, not mine. But when you are influenced to look at the behavior of the one brother while overlooking the behavior of and the attitude of the other brother, the enemy wants you to think the drinking, smoking, cussing, clubbing, porn watching, whatever, brother is the real prodigal. It's, it's, the, it's the one who stayed home. He closed the door, had a party with the other brother. And, and if you look at this, we can look at this in a couple different ways. There's many different, um, facets of this story if you want to look at it like that you know I, I like to say you know the the um the one who went away is the new covenant the one who stayed home is the old covenant you could also look at this as the one who went away is the gentiles the one who stayed home is the jews um there's many different facets you can look at this but the bottom line is this the father loved them both the same. <laughs> the father loved them both the same. Even the well-behaved one, he, he loved him. And he was like, man, come in here with us. Hang out. Love your brother. He's not harming himself anymore. 
He, he's, he's here with us. He loved them both the same. And that's what ultimately matters. That's what ultimately is what the new covenant is founded on. It's the love of God. The love of God is the foundation of the new covenant. You know, if God did not love us, if he didn't love the world, he would not have sent Jesus here. But God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. He gave us Jesus. Jesus is the new covenant. Jesus. His blood brought in the new covenant. <laughs> there's, there's no fly in the ointment. So, all right, guys. Um, also, um, and that's the, end, <laughs> that's the end of my message. I, I want to talk about a couple things other uh, real quick. Also, if, if you're watching on Instagram um, and you're watching it live right now, thank you. But a lot of people, they watch these later. Um, and if you want to watch any of my older walk talks, you can always go to my Instagram profile, go over to the videos tab, and then I've got 40 or 50 of them there. I also started reposting these on Facebook. So if you're watching this in the future and it's on Facebook, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I don't have all of them on Facebook. So if you want to watch more, I think I have four or five posted on Facebook so far. Um, but if you want to watch more and you're on Facebook, go over to Instagram, check out my Instagram account, check out the videos tab. I think it's the third tab over. Um, also, Instagram has changed their algorithms. They're wanting to basically mimic, mimic TikTok. So they are pushing TikToks onto your, or they're pushing reels onto your feeds. So you're not going to get to see this live video um, very as often. So the percentage has, has gone down. So the views are gonna go down. Uh, I, I know, I'm not really worried about that. So if, you, if you're not seeing this on a regular basis, I do these walk talks a few times a week, go to my profile, turn on the notifications. That way, when I begin these lives, you'll get notified. All right, guys, so. I hope this has encouraged you today. Um, always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? <laughs> These are all truths of the new covenant. You're righteous. Why? Because of Jesus. You're blameless. Why? Because of the blood. You're holy. Why? Because of his blood. You're a new creation. Why? Because of what happened at the cross and through the resurrection. You're righteous, holy, blameless, new creation. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't have any part in this covenant. This is not your covenant. You do not have a covenant with God. If you have a covenant with God, it has to be done perfectly just like Israel. So you don't have to do that. You get to rest in the covenant between the Father and the Son. That's the new covenant. So I hope you all have enjoyed this today. And I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.